Hello, everyone. It's my pleasure to be here from Brazil to share this keynote uh, speech session that's going to be presented by Professor Leandro Minko. Leandro is a senior lecturer at the School of Computer Science, the University of Birmingham in the UK. And uh, he's doing a, a really, really nice research in software engineering for the last years. And he's involved in different uh, uh, topics, including data stream, machine learning. Uh, and then we are going to see an, an, an amazing talk by him that's regarding the prediction of defect inducing software change in dynamic environments. I'm quite excited to, do, to see it. And uh, Leandro has contributed a lot with the software engineering community. It's, thank you so much, Leandro, for being here with us at the Ibero-American conference. It's a nice uh, thing. Uh, uh, it's a wonderful event in the uh, Ibero-American system at this year celebrating uh, a, a joint uh, union of uh, people and research in Costa Rica. That's so nice to, to be here. And uh, besides all the, all the roles that uh, Leandro plays, plays uh, he's um, involved with different uh, scientific journals like empirical software engineering, software systems, uh, transactions on neural networks and learning systems. And also he plays a lot of, uh, a lot of stuff in the community by, by sharing uh, really nice uh, conferences and events like Promise. He's, he used to be the program chair of Promise for the, the last year. So thank you so much, Leandro. You are on the stage right now and uh, hope that all the people can enjoy your talk. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Guilherme, for the very kind introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and be able to discuss with all of you about prediction of defect-inducing software chains in dynamic environments. Um, here is an outline of my talk. I'm first going to give a motivation and a definition for the problem of predicting defect-inducing software chains, PDC. So it's basically the problem where we want to predict whether a software change is clean or defect-inducing. Then I'm going to talk about the challenge that we face when we are trying to use machine learning for PDC. This challenge involves noisy data, class imbalance, which is when we have much more examples of one category, for example, clean software chains than another category, for example, the defect inducing software chains. Uh, another challenge is the lack of data in the beginning of a software project. And finally, uh, the last challenge that I'm going to discuss with you today is dynamic environments. So these dynamic environments basically mean that the defect generating process may suffer change over time. These chains, also called concept drifts, can affect the relationship between the input features describing the software chains and the output that we want to predict, whether that change is defect inducing or clean. There are also concept drifts that affect the proportion of defect inducing software chains over time. And all of these can impair the predictive performance of PDC models. Now, the main focus of this talk is on this dynamic environment. So after I discuss this challenge faced by machine learning for PDC, I'm going to talk about how to tackle these dynamic environments, how to tackle these chains or concept drifts, right? And this will involve the collection of data over time and learning PDC models over time. And finally, I'm going to finish the talk with conclusions and future directions. So just before I start talking about the content of the talk itself, let me just talk a little bit about my research group. Uh, so I work for the University of Birmingham, which is located in the UK, more specifically, more or less in the middle of England. It's about one hour away from London by train or around three hours uh, by car. Um, and Birmingham as a city is a very large city by European standards. It has more than one million inhabitants that makes it the second largest city in the UK. So I think for people from different countries, sometimes one million inhabitants can look like a quite small city, right? Uh, but in, in terms of European cities, it's actually a quite large city. The University of Birmingham was founded back in 1825. So it's been here for many years. If you come to the campus, you are able to see some very nice 
uh, more historic uh, type of buildings like this one. Uh, but you also able to see some very modern and new buildings, especially over the past few years, the university has uh, made a, a very large investment in facilities on campus. Uh, I'm also uh, very proud to say that before coming to the UK and before doing my PhD in the UK, I studied my BSc in computer science at the Federal University of Paraná in Brazil. And I studied my MSc in computer science in the Federal University of Pernambuco in Brazil. So this makes me even happier to be able to be here uh, to discuss with all of you during the uh, Ibero-American Conference on Software Engineering. Um, my lab works mainly with two areas of research. One of these areas is artificial intelligence and the other area is software engineering. In the area of artificial intelligence, we work with learning in dynamic environments, class imbalance learning, transfer learning, ensemble learning, and evolutionary algorithms. Whereas in the area of software engineering, we work mainly with the applications of artificial intelligence to software engineering problems, such as software defect prediction, software effort decimation, and software project scheduling. In this talk, I'm going to focus mainly on the problem of software defect prediction. This talk is mainly based on these two papers that were published in 2019 and 2020, but I'm also going to make reference to some other studies, including studies from other authors uh, during the talk. So let's start with the motivation and the definition of prediction of defect inducing software chains or PDC. As you know, software systems have become ever larger and more complex. The size of the global software industry was estimated a while ago as being more than 400 billion US dollars. But at the same time, the cost of bugs to the global economy was estimated to be more than 300 billion US dollars annually. So you can see here that the cost of bugs to the global economy is very large compared to the size of the global software industry. There are more recent estimates that um, tell, for instance, that the software defects are estimated to cost around 1.7 trillion US dollars internationally. So this is an even larger uh, estimate than the previous ones, right? And this estimate in particular takes into account not only the impact that software defects have uh, on the software industry itself, but also on the, all, all the other industries that depend on software. And worse than that, right? Software defects uh, are not only costly, but they are also potentially dangerous. And this is because software is really everywhere, everywhere nowadays, right? So people are talking about autonomous driving cars, right? Which are basically going to be driven by software. But actually software is in our cars right now. The cars that we are driving, they also make use of a lot of software, right? And indeed, there's been several recalls of cars to fix software bugs. Some of these bugs were potentially dangerous bugs, right? Imagine a software defect in the software that is controlling an airplane, how dangerous that could be, right? Or a software defect in the software that is controlling a robotic arm that's operating you. Right, so this could be really serious. Okay, um, and the problem is that the cost of debugging, testing, and verification uh, is very large. It's estimated to account for fifty to seventy-five percent of the total budget of software development projects. Um, and even if you spend all that time and all that money testing, debugging, and verifying the software teams, they are still dealing with limited testing resources. They are often facing very strong pressure towards rapid delivery, right? So it's very difficult to reduce the number of defects in software or to prevent defects. Right? But the good news is that artificial intelligence has the potential to help improving the cost effectiveness of the testing or the inspection process, ultimately, contributing towards better software quality. 
one way, one of the ways with which artificial intelligence could help is through prediction of defect-inducing software changes, PDC. The idea here is that the developer may be implementing a software change, right? And then this developer is going to commit this change to a software versioning repository, right? At this commit point, we could have a PDC model that could alert the software developer of the fact that this software change is likely to induce defects, right? And if this software change is likely to induce defects, this uh, model or this AI, right, uh, could encourage the developer to further inspect and test this change before confirming the commit. Right? So this has several advantages, right? The first advantage is that it helps the developers to focus more on the chains that are more likely to induce defects. So as I've mentioned earlier, the testing resources are limited so if we can allocate this testing resource in a smarter way so that we focus more effort, more testing effort on the chains that are more likely to induce defects, then we may be able to find more defects by using the same amount of resources, right? Another advantage is that at this stage, the code is still fresh in the developer's mind, right? So it's much easier and much cheaper cheaper to inspect the code at this stage than later at the debugging time. Another advantage is that software chains are typically small. So they are much easier to inspect than whole files, for example. And finally, the inspection or the test allocation to developers is straightforward so long as the company is accepting the fact that the person who would be allocated to further test or first further inspect this software change is the developer who has just implemented the software change. So PDC is typically done based on machine learning, right? So how to adopt machine learning for PDC? Well, we could assume that we have a software versioning repository, right? And we could have potentially also a bug tracking system. The bug tracking system is not essential, but it can help if you have it, right? And this information from the software repository and the bug tracking system can be fed to an algorithm called SZZ. This algorithm is going to identify which past software chains contained defects and which past software chains were actually clean, right? It does that by first identifying which software chains are fixes. If these software chains are fixes, they are fixing defects. They are fixing parts of the code that induced defects, right? So the software chains that produce those parts of the code that are being fixed are considered by the SEZ algorithm as being the defect inducing software chains. And the other software chains are the clean ones, right? So once you use SEZ to identify which past software chains were defect inducing and which past software chains were actually clean, then we can create a data set, a training set containing lots of examples of software chains described by input features such as the number of modified subsystems, the number of lines of code that were added or, or perhaps the number of lines of code that were removed or modified, information on whether or not this change itself is a fix, uh, the developer experience in terms of, for example, the number of changes that this developer contributed in this project and so on, right? Each software change is also assigned a label telling whether the software change was clean or defect inducing. Once we have this training set, we can feed it to a machine learning algorithm Right, And this machine learning algorithm can then uh, produce a predictive model. And once we have the predictive model, then we can start using this predictive model to predict the new software chains, right? to predict whether these new software chains are clean or if they are defect inducing. Okay. Now, if we adopt machine learning for PDC, we face several challenges, and I'm going to discuss some of these challenges uh, with you now. 
Uh, one of the challenges uh, is related to the SSE algorithm, right? So the SSE algorithm may lead to noise. It may not really successfully identify all the software chains that were clean and all the software chains that were defect inducing, right? So this label defect inducing or clean assigned by the SSE algorithm to the different software chains may not always be correct. Right. So there's been a lot of work on improving this SSZ algorithm so that it leads to less noise in the data. Another challenge is referred to as class imbalance. So this challenge affects the, the data set that we've collected here. Right. It means that we typically have much more examples of a certain category, for example, uh, clean software chains than another category, for example, the defect inducing software chains. If we have much more examples of clean chains than defect inducing chains, that could mean that the machine learning algorithm is going to struggle to produce a predictive model that is able to identify defect inducing software chains. Right? The machine learning algorithm may focus too much on the majority category, the clean category, for example, Right, and then the predictive model will struggle to recognize examples of defect inducing software chains. Now, people have been attempting to deal with this issue in PDC, and one of the strategies that has been used quite a lot is the strategy of resampling. There are many different resampling strategies. I'm going to give you here a brief example of one of these strategies. Right. So you could, for example, replicate examples of the minority category, for example, replicate examples of the defect inducing uh, category. Right. And by replicating these examples, you will call more attention of the machine learning algorithm towards this minority category so that the resulting predictive model will be better able to recognize this category. Okay. Another challenge also uh, refers here to, oops, okay. Another challenge here also refers to this uh, data set that we collected, right? Um, and this challenge is a challenge uh, related to the data that is coming from within the project that you are interested in predicting. At the beginning of the project, you may not have a lot of data that comes from within the context of this project itself, because you may not have created so many software chains in this project yet, right? So if you are using only within project training data to create your predictive model, then you may not have enough data to produce a well-performing predictive model, right? So existing work has been attempting to use cross-project data, which are data that are coming from other projects to create a larger training set that can lead to a good predictive model, okay? And the existing work has been quite successful in obtaining good results by adopting cross-project uh, data for PDC, okay? Um, the other challenge and the last challenge that I'm going to mention to you here is the challenge of dynamic environments, right? So this challenge affects here the environments where these predictive models are being adopted. And it refers to the fact that the defect generating process may suffer chains over time. These chains are referred to as concept drifts, right? And when these chains happen, they mean that a predictive model that was previously performing well may start to underperform. Okay, so these chains, these concept drifts, could cause PDC models to be unreliable. At any given point in time, these models may be performing very well, and then next, they may be performing very poorly. Okay, so I'm going to focus on this challenge in this talk, even though I'm going to mention some aspects that are related to the other challenges as well. Right. So, but let me talk a little bit more about these dynamic environments and in particular about these concept drifts, these chains that may affect the defect generating process. One of the concept drifts is a concept drift that may affect the relationship between inputs, the input features describing your software chains 
and the output, whether this software chain is likely to be defect inducing or not, right? So let me give you an example of this type of concept drift to help you with understanding what exactly it means, right? So let's say that your defect generating process is governed by a rule, an underlying rule that looks like this, right? This input feature and dev is between three and 10, and perhaps some other features here also have certain specific values. If the end dev is between three and 10, and these other conditions are satisfied, then the change is defect inducing. This end dev is the number of developers that changed the files that were modified by this software change that we are uh, predicting as defect inducing or clean, right? Now, it may be that for a while, this rule here underlines the behavior of the defect generating process. But maybe at a certain point in time, some change may happen, a concept drift, right? And now maybe the rule becomes like this. We don't really have n dev between three and 10 here. We have n dev between five and 14. So if this is the new rule underlying the defect generating process, then a model that learns this rule here will start to underperform, right? If we have n dev three, uh, below three, right? Uh, sorry, if we have an NDEV that is um, uh, three or four, right? This software change, if it satisfies these other conditions here, right? Is going to be considered as defect inducing, right? But now this change shouldn't be considered as defect inducing anymore, right? Because the NDEV needs to be between five and 14. And this change has three or four, okay? And similarly, uh, if we have an NDEV that is of 11 uh, to 14, this change is, is not going to be considered as defect inducing based on this rule here. But now it should have been considered as defect inducing, right? Um, so if we don't cater for these concept drifts, uh, this could lead to poorly performing predictive models. Right. A model that was performing well may start to underperform. Okay. And it's understandable uh, that this could happen in PDC, right? Because for example, the project, the software project is evolving over time. It's maturing over time, right? And as this project is maturing over time, we can expect certain changes to happen. I give you an example here. Right, so in this plot here, I show you this NDEV, this input feature, over time for two open source projects. And we can see here that even though um, there are several software changes, each, each one of these points here is a different software change, right, that was committed over time. And we can see that there are always some software changes here that have a very low NDEV. But over time, we see here an increasing trend on the end dev of many software chains. Right? Now, this end dev was the number of developers that changed the modified files over time. So of course, we can expect this value to increase over time as the project gets older. Right? As the project gets older, more and more developers are like to have, likely to have touched the files. Right? So we can expect to see these trends here in many of the projects, right? And if overall this NDEV of the software chains was increasing over time, the NDEV associated to the defect inducing software chains is also likely to increase. And then we could have a change in, in the rule underlying the behavior of the defect generating process, such as a change that I illustrated to you in the previous slide, right? Um, so PDC models may become obsolete over time, leading to poor predictive performance if this type of constant drift occurs. And in fact, we found that if we don't deal with this type of constant drift, uh, our approach will end up having a predictive performance that in our experiments was up to 40% worse than the predictive performance that could be achieved if we were actually treating these concept drifts. Okay. 
There is another type of concept drift, which is a concept drift that affects the proportion of defect inducing software chains over time. And again, this could happen uh, because uh, the, the project is maturing over time, right? Uh, let me give you here uh, a couple of examples, right? So in this plot here, I'll show you the proportion of clean software chains and the proportion of defect inducing software chains over time for this project here, Camel. Okay. We can see here that there is an increasing trend on the proportion of clean software chains and a decreasing trend in the proportion of defect inducing software chains. Okay. The class imbalance ratio, which is the proportion of clean over defect inducing examples, became up to four times higher in the software projects that we analyzed over time. Right? So that means that this class imbalance problem was becoming more and more severe over time, more and more difficult to deal with over time. Right? And if our approach to tackle class imbalance is not taking into account this evolution in the imbalance status of the problem over time, it may stop to perform well. Right. Um, now, there are potential reasons behind this class imbalance evolution, right? It may be that uh, the project has less and less defects as this project matures, for instance, right? So if you are not really incorporating too many new features in this software, over time, you may be basically maintaining this software. And as you maintain it, you may be finding more and more bugs and you may be fixing more and more bugs. And so this project is going to become less and less defective over time, right? Or it could even be that the defects can be more quickly found in the beginning of the software projects, right? So this would have this effect of uh, perceived uh, class imbalance uh, ratio to be smaller in the beginning and increase over time. Right. Um, this is another example from the Fabric 8 project, right? In this case here, you can see that there are certain periods of time where there were peaks in the number of defect inducing software chains, right? So here we are not really seeing those increasing and decreasing trends, but we are seeing these peaks at certain points in time, right? These peaks are so severe that during certain periods of time, the defect inducing category is actually a majority and not a minority, right? So if you are adopting a strategy to tackle class imbalance during this period of time, and you don't realize that now the clean class is actually the mi minority, then this approach, this class imbalance strategy is not going to work so well, right? And again, there are several potential reasons behind uh, this potential, these peaks here, right? One of them is refactorings. The other one is the incorporation of new functionalities in the software, and there may be others, right? In the case of Fabric 8, we were able to identify that these peaks here happened at the same time as this software project was going through major refactorings, okay? So when we are learning PDC models over time, uh, if we ignore class imbalance evolution by, for example, fixing the resampling rate at the beginning of the project and never updating it over time, uh, then we could get poor predictive performance, right? Because the imbalance status of the problem may have changed. And the assumptions that we are making in our resampling strategy may not be valid anymore. Right. And in our experiments, we found that strategies that don't update the resampling rate over time can be up to 97.2% worse in terms of predictive performance than strategies that are actually uh, taking into account this evolution in the class imbalance status of the problem. Okay. Right. So, it is important for us to consider realistic scenarios that take chronology into account in PDC, right? If we don't take into account this chronology, we may not notice these problems. We may not notice that there are concept drifts that may be affecting the predictive performance of our PDC models, right? 
So, okay, but how to tackle these concept drifts? Right? So tackling these concept drifts will involve collecting additional data over time and learning over time. Right? Now, most existing work in PDC assumes that we never receive any new training examples over time. If we are not receiving new training examples over time, we cannot update our models over time to be able to tackle concept drifts. Right? But in reality, we are producing new software chains over time in software projects. And these new software chains can lead to new training examples that can be used to update our predictive models over time. Right? So we have chains that may be happening over time uh, in the environment where the PDC model is being adopted, but we also have additional training data being produced over time. So we can attempt to tackle these chains over time right, by using these training examples. But of course, nothing is really straightforward, right? One thing that we need to consider here is verification latency. The label of these training examples arise with a delay, right? This delay is inherent to the PDC problem, right? So the developer is implementing a change and then the developer commits this change. At commit time, we still don't know what the true label of the software change is. If we knew, we didn't need to predict it, right? So we don't know, that's why we need a prediction, right? Uh, so the label of the software uh, changes is arriving with a delay, which means that the training examples arrive with a delay, okay? We, we need to wait for a certain period of time to find out whether the software change was really clean or defect inducing before we can use it as a training example, okay? And this uh, box plot here in the log scale right, is showing the time that it took to find out defects associated to software chains in several different projects. This varied all the way from one day to 11.5 years. Right? So it can vary quite a lot, but most of the time, uh, the time that it took to find out defects to be associated to certain software chains was around or less than 90 days, right? Around here, okay. Um, okay, so if we ignore chronology and if we ignore this verification latency in our research studies, we may be creating unrealistic PDC models that may appear to be very accurate when in fact they were not. Why? Because we will have been using training examples that in practice wouldn't have existed yet. Right? We may be using training examples to update our predictive model that would be available only in the future. Right? So we may think that our predictive model is performing very well in research, but in practice it wouldn't really, just because that training data wouldn't have been available. Right? Um, so chronology and verification latency should be taken into account, not only in practice where you are forced to take them into account, right? But also in research. Sometimes uh, this issue may be overlooked because in research, we have already collected all the data. We, we, in research, we are basically simulating what will have happened in practice, right? Uh, but actually, in fact, we already have all that data here and we already have all the label of all those data here. Right. So sometimes uh, it's easy to overlook this issue, right? But uh, we, we should take into account not only in practice, but also in research, that this data is arriving with a certain chronological order and there is verification latency, okay? So we proposed a verification latency framework for continuous learning in PDC. And this framework takes into account three different cases. In the first case, to label our uh, training examples, our software chains, we consider that the software change was created at a certain point in time, and then we have to wait for a certain period of time, which we refer to as the waiting time, right? To be confident enough that this software change is clean. 
If we wait for this waiting time and we don't observe any defect associated to the software change, then we can say, oh, we are confident enough that this software change is clean. So let's label it as a clean software change and send it for training. Right? We can say that a clean software change has a label of zero, for example, right? The other case is a case where we were waiting for that waiting time, but before the, the end of that period of time, we found that this software change was actually associated to a defect. So as soon as we find that out, we can immediately label this software change as defect inducing, right? And send the training example for, for training. We don't need to wait until the end of this waiting time anymore because we already know this software change is defect inducing. Okay. And the third case is a case where we waited for all that time. We actually labeled that change as clean based on case two, right? But later on, we found out that, oh, actually we thought that the label of that software change was clean, but now we found out that there was a defect associated to that software change. Right. So let's swap the label of that software change and send it for training again. Okay. So this is the third case. So we can have a continuous learning framework for PDC uh, that works as follows. Let's consider that we have an incoming software change. This software change may be a cross project software change, or it may be within project, right? If this software change, if, if this project from which this um, change is coming from uh, is the project that we are interested in predicting, um, if it's not the project that we are interested in predicting, then uh, we would simply add this software change to a queue that contains all the software chains that are waiting to be labeled. It's a wait for labels queue, right? But if this project that produced the software change is the project that we are interested in predicting, then um, we first need to provide a prediction to the software change, right? Predict it as either being clean or defect inducing. And then we add the software change to the wait for labels queue. Once we add it to the wait for labels queue, then we need to check whether any example within this queue is ready to be labeled. That could be the case where uh, the waiting time has already passed and no defect was found to be associated to the software change. Or it could be the case where we found a defect associated to one of the software chains. Right. So if these examples uh, can be labeled, then we need to remove the example from that queue right, and label it. As soon as we label it, we send it for training. Okay. Now, if this label is a clean label, then we still need to add this software change to a hash, to a hash table that contains all the clean software chains that we observed so far. Why do we need to do that? Well, because any software change that was previously considered as clean could still potentially present defects or could still potentially induce defects, right? So we need to check all the software chains that are in this clean hash to see if a defect was found to be associated to, to those chains, okay? If it was, then we need to remove that software change from the clean hash because that, that change is not really clean anymore, right? Um, and then we can swap the label of that change to tell that that change is, is defect inducing, right? And send it for training. Okay. Of course, uh, if none of the examples that was there within that wait for label queues was ready to be labeled, then we don't need to label it, right? So we can jump all these steps and come out straight away here, right? Similarly, if the change that we labeled uh, was defect inducing, we don't need to add it to the clean hash, right? But basically after we do this, uh, we can iterate through these steps over and over again, uh, basically forever, right? <laughs> While you, you, uh, you still want to use PDC models, okay? 
Now, but how, how to train the predictive models based on these changes that are arriving over time, based on the training examples that are being created over time? Okay. Well, actually, even though um, uh, most work uh, uses machine learning for offline learning, where we assume that the whole training set is available beforehand, there are many machine learning approaches that are prepared to work for continuous learning. They can also be called online learning approaches. Right? So these approaches are able to learn each separate training example uh, as it arrives and then discard it. Right? Um, examples of machine learning algorithms that operate in online or continuous mode are online baggy or hoffling trees and so on. There are others. Okay. But even if we are adopting one of these continuous learning algorithms, we still need strategies to cope with concept drift. Right? We need strategies to enable these algorithms to quickly react to change that may affect the proportion of defect-inducing uh, examples. And we need strategies to react to change that may affect the relationship between inputs and outputs. Right? If we don't adopt a strategy like this, it, it will take a lot of time for the predictive model to recover from these concept drifts. Okay. So what could we do? What sort of strategy could we use to quickly react to these concept drifts? Well, let's talk first about the change in the proportion of clean and defect-inducing examples over time. Right? So these chains are related to our strategies to deal with class imbalance, right? Because the level of class imbalance may be changing over time. Okay. Now, remember that I mentioned that one of the strategies adopted to deal with class imbalance is resampling. Right? So we could, for example, replicate examples of the minority class to draw enough attention from the machine learning algorithm towards the minority category, right? Um, these strategies are being adopted in an attempt to improve the recall on the defect-inducing category without hindering the recall on the clean category so much, right? Why is that? Well, if we have a low defect-inducing recall, that means that we are missing many defect-inducing software chains. Um, but at the same time, if we have a low clean recall, that means that we have a high false alarm rate, right? So it means that we, uh, we are predicting many software chains to be defect inducing when actually they were clean, okay? So this also kills the purpose of the PC PDC models, right? Because we are telling the software developers, oh, you should pay really close attention on the software change here because it's likely to induce defect. And this other one as well, and that other one as well, and most of them, right? Um, if that happens, um, the developer is going to spend a lot of time inspecting those chains to, to find out at the end that, oh, actually there was no defect in, in those software chains. So the developer will completely lose trust in the approach, right? Um, so this resampling rate uh, is typically decided based on the imbalance ratio of the problem, right? How, what is the proportion of clean examples uh, compared to the number of um, defect-inducing examples, right? Um, but if the imbalance ratio is evolving over time and we are adopting continuous learning, then this resampling strategy also needs to adapt, right? If the choice was made uh, the, the number of times that you replicate examples, for example, of the minority category is based on the imbalance ratio, and this imbalance ratio is changing over time, your resampling rate also needs to change over time. Okay. But should we really adopt the resampling rate, um, choose the resampling rate by tracking the imbalance ratio over time? Well, there are some problems for us in attempting to do that in PDC. Uh, the first one is that we do not really have the labels of the most recent examples, right? Because of verification latency. So we can't really track the exact current imbalance ratio. 
And the second problem is that even if we could, the best resampling rate may not correspond to imbalance ratio. If the minority category is easy to identify and we emphasize it too much, it may be that we are emphasizing it in detriment of the other class, the other category. If the minority category is too difficult to identify, we may need to emphasize it further, right? Um, so we shouldn't just use um, the imbalance ratio itself to decide how much replications we should have for our minority category examples. But there is a heuristic here that we can use. In particular, uh, if the minority class is too easy and we are overemphasizing it, we are very likely to be predicting this class too often. Right? And if the minority category is too difficult to identify, we may not be predicting this category often enough. So uh, we proposed an approach called oversampling rate boosting, which will further adjust the resampling rate over time based on how often we are predicting the defect inducing category over time. We track how often we are predicting the defect inducing category by using a moving average of the predictions of the defect inducing class based on a window of recent data, right? So these axis here of this plot shows uh, the moving average of the predictions on the defect inducing class. If this moving average has a large value, that means that we are predicting the defect inducing class too often, right? And so we need to boost the resampling rate of the clean class by multiplying it by a factor taken from this function here, right? So that the more we predict the defect inducing class, the more we actually need to boost the resampling rate for the, uh, sorry, the more we predict the defect inducing class, the more we need to boost the resampling rate of the clean class, right? And similarly, if this moving average is small, that means that we are not predicting the defect inducing class often enough, right? So we need to boost the resampling rate for the defect inducing class by multiplying it by a factor taken from this function here. Okay. And by adopting that, we, we can significantly improve the results over other approaches. So I show you here a summary of the results of our experiments on 10 open source data sets. And the first thing to note here is that we can see that a strategy that fixed the resampling rate based on the imbalance ratio at the beginning of the project is not really getting good predictive performance. The G-mean, which is the geometric mean between the recall on the clean class and on the defect inducing class is very low, it's below 50%, right? The difference in the recall on the clean class and on the defect inducing class is also very large. That means that we have a very good recall on one class at the expense of a very bad recall on the other class. Right? So we are able to recognize examples of one class, but we are not really able to recognize examples of the other uh, class very well. Okay. Now, if we use this strategy that I mentioned to you, right, uh, then we can get top G means and the difference uh, between the recalls is also much lower, okay? And these results here are better, for instance, than if we were simply retraining our predictive models based on a window of most recent data. They are also better results than the state-of-the-art approach for class imbalance learning from the machine learning literature, OB and UOB. In fact, the difference in the recalls achieved by our proposed ORB approach was up to 45% better than OBs and up to 63% better than UOBs. Okay. So tracking the proportion of predictions given to the different categories over time, right, the defect inducing or clean, can help us with tackling cast imbalance evolution in PDC 
leading to better predictive performance, better G-means, and better difference between the recalls. But this is just tackling this evolution in the proportion of examples of the defect inducing and the clean class over time. We still have those chains that may affect the relationship between the input features and the outputs that we want to predict, right? So how to tackle these other types of chains or concept drifts, right? So one thing that we ask is, can we actually use cross-project training examples to speed up adaptation to concept drifts? Because this cross-project data are representing a variety of projects under different stages. Right? So using this cross-project data to train PDC models over time could help to prevent drops in predictive performance caused by concept drift that may happen over time. Right? If this concept drift is happening because the project is becoming more mature, well, there may be other projects that were already mature before. So maybe data from those projects can help for us to provide predictions to this project. Right? And indeed, we found that that was really the case. I show you here some sample results of a study that was based on 10 open source data sets. Uh, and we can see here this black line, right, is the predictive performance in terms of gene over time for a within project approach. We can see that there are some very severe drops in the predictive performance of the within project approach. Now, the cross-project approach, which are shown here in orange and red, they managed to prevent or reduce these drops in predictive performance, right? Uh, and indeed, this uh, uh, cross-project approach obtained up to 40% better G-means than within project approach during these periods of drop in predictive performance, which are likely to be affected by concept right? So in continuous PDC, cross-project learning is helpful, not only in the initial stages of the project where we may have little within project data, but also they may have a prolonged benefit, right? Uh, cross-project data may have a prolonged benefit because it may help us to deal with concept drifts that may happen over time, right? So if we use cross-project data, we can get better genes over time. Now, this approach that I showed in orange and red here, they basically mix cross-project and within project data all together. Right? So you have all this data coming from different projects. They're all mixed together and used to train a predictive model. We also investigated another approach that creates a separate uh, predictive model for data coming from different projects. Right, so each project will lead to a different predictive model. And then we combine these predictive models together into an ensemble to provide predictions. Right? This ensemble approach helped to prevent the drops in predictive performance, but overall it didn't really perform that well. Right? Uh, so we can see here right, in this green line that the performance of this uh, ensemble cross-project approach was not so good compared to the other approach. Okay. This suggests us that the larger amount of varied data obtained when we merge within project and cross project data together to build PDC models is essential, right? In fact, we found out that those separate predictive models that compose the ensemble, each one of those models was itself not very accurate. That's why the ensemble as a whole was not accurate either. Right. So we actually need the models to be trained with this large variety of data so that they will be helpful to deal with concept drifts. Uh, sorry, so that they, they will be able to obtain good predictive performance. Right. Despite all of this approach, all of this cross-project approach, being able to prevent large drops in predictive performance. Okay. We also performed experiments with data from three proprietary projects from a company that we were collaborating with. Uh, and again, the cross-project approach obtained top results right, for the proprietary data as well. Okay. The improvements in GME were of up to 17.72% across the whole period of time of the project. Right. Um, 
Now, the interesting thing to note here about the study with the proprietary data is that the cross-project approach that performed the best was the cross-project approach that was mixing together data, cross-project data from within this company with open source data. Right? So the open source data helped to improve the results on the proprietary data. And again, this is suggesting us that the larger amount of varied data obtained when merging within project and cross-project data for building PDC models is essential. Right? But it's just important to bear in mind that the amount of within project data was still important. Right? The performance of the approach improved over time as more within project data was received. So we shouldn't throw away the within project data. Right? Okay, so conclusions and future directions. Um, when adopting machine learning for software engineering, it's important to consider learning scenarios that are as close as possible to reality. Right? In, in the case of this approach that I showed you here, we were focusing on the fact that PDC operates in dynamic environments. Right? We were taking into account chronology so that we are closer to a, real, a more realistic scenario that will be faced by software companies. Right? When we take chronology into account, we can see that these dynamic environments can cause PDC models to be unreliable because of concept drifts or chains, right? Affecting the relationship between the input features and the output that we want to predict. And because of concept drifts affecting the proportion of defect inducing software chains over time. Right? To tackle these dynamic environments, continuous data collection and learning should be performed to avoid these unreliable PDC models. And for that, we need to collect data over time, bearing in mind verification latency. We can use resampling rates that are changing over time, that are being adjusted over time in continuous learning. And we can use cross-project training examples to help avoiding large drops in predictive performance. We found that the variety and the amount of data was important to produce good predictive models. And finally, the within project training examples remained important even when we were using cross-project approach. Right? So our cross-project approach need to mix uh, together within project and cross-project training examples. In terms of future directions, I would like to encourage everyone, that includes you, it includes me, my own research group as well, right, to revisit all the work on machine learning for software engineering to check how realistic is the scenario that we were adopting in our study when we investigated those machine learning approaches, right? Maybe there are other software engineering problems that also suffer from dynamic environments and we haven't noticed. Or there may be additional considerations that we need to make other than dynamic scenarios. For example, in PDC, what changes need to be made to the software development process itself so that we adopt to these PDC models? Or how would software developers interact with PDC models in practice, right? And finally, developing tools for acquiring data and learning over time in PDC is going to be something very helpful, right, for research in this area and for adoption in practice. Okay, so that's basically it. Um, um, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, thank you so much, Dr. Minko by this excellent talk, fantastic. It's a sort of uh, problem and topic that deserves a lot of attention from the community. And uh, we need to learn too much from the software. We need to understand the software, understand the dynamic of how we can build this sort of a product. If we call it a product, I don't know, but uh, uh, it's it's uh, uh, something really really nice. Not just the idea of the quality in the in the perspective of the defect, but also in the perspective of the effort that uh, that's another part of uh, your uh, excellent research 
that's not part of this talk, but it, it's something that we need to be aware about. But uh, I, have, I have some questions for you. And uh, I, we also have questions from the audience. I'm just waiting from, uh, for them in, in, the, in the chat. But um, something that called me my, my attention was, uh, okay, um, you evaluated a, a, a set of uh, projects, uh, conventional software, and uh, the range of identifying a defect is from one day to 11 years. Is there any explanation for that? So okay. actually for one day, one day is fine for me, but 11 years. Um, there are many potential reasons there. Of course, 11 years was an extreme, right? It's an outlier there in a sense, right? It was the largest uh, amount of time. Uh, there are many potential reasons behind it. it Maybe that this defect was in an area of the software that wasn't really much used, right? Maybe even it could be that this defect was not really accessible and people were not really accessing at all that part of the code when you know people were using the software. But maybe something happened that changed the software and then people had access to that part uh, of the code and used it and then the defect was found. It could be that, right? Or it could even be that there is some problem in terms of the data collection itself, right? That led to this delay in identifying okay. this defect. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it makes sense. That's true. Yeah. Uh, we have a question from the audience here. And uh, as the SCZ algorithm has a delay for detecting defect, can other methods such as code analyzers Static and analysis help find the problem defect inducing commits with less delay. So, uh, so these approaches here, uh, in terms of learning over time, they will will always face this trouble because um, we need to wait to find out whether a software change is clean or defect inducing, right? and only after we find this label, we can use it for training, at least with the supervised learning approach, right? There, there is another topic there uh, that uh, is about trying to, to use data that is unlabeled to speed up you know, the ability of this approach to learn over time. But there are strategies, for example, um, um, bug localization, strategies that you could potentially use to try and locate the, uh, the, the exact location of the defect, right? But usually these strategies, they are already using some information from testing as well, right? Uh, so in this case, um, it may still take some time for you to be able to, to, to localize the defect, right? And, and find out that a certain part of the code was the defective part of the code. I don't know if that answers your question. Okay, thank you. If they send uh, the audience, send some uh, new question. Yeah, another one. Do you have Do you have any hypothesis for other dynamic environments that might be affected by concept drift in approach that mine software repositories? Yes. Uh, so one of the other areas uh, that I worked with is software effort estimation, uh, and this is another case of software engineering problem that suffers change over time. Uh, in this case, there may be change in the management strategy of the company, or maybe, I don't know, you have some employees leaving the company and so on. And this could uh, change the effort that is required to develop a software project over time. Right? So this is one of the areas, but there are dynamic scenarios even beyond mining software repositories as well. So there is a whole area of search-based software engineering where solutions to software engineering problems are being uh, uh, produced by artificial intelligence approach, but the solutions may also need to adapt over time, right? So software project scheduling is one of these examples, right? So you schedule, you create a nice schedule to a certain project, but maybe a person that was working in the project becomes ill, for example. Uh, but that person was allocated to the project. So how to best change this schedule to take into account the fact that this person cannot work in the project anymore, 
Right? So this is another type of dynamics. So I believe that there are um, several different problems there where the dynamics may need to be taken into account. All right. So we are in time for the next uh, section. I would like to thank you, Professor Leandro Minko, again. It has been my pleasure to be here with you. I would, I would like also to, to thank uh, my friend, Heitor, Professor Heitor Costa from Brazil, that helped me with the questions together with the, the operator of the system, the Zoom system. Thank you so much. And hope you can enjoy CBC as much as I am doing. Leandro, muito obrigado. Muito Foi obrigado. Fantástico. Foi um prazer. Muito uh, bom. Vocês. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>